This afternoon, we have uh, a presentation from uh, Dr. Sarah Sasson, who's one of the Cientia Fellows at the Kirby Institute. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which, from which we all join this meeting and, uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and uh, pay my respects also to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us today. I myself join uh, this call from uh, the lands of the Darwal people. So today we're fortunate to have a presentation from uh, Sarah, who, as I said, is one of the Cientia Fellows at the Kirby Institute. Uh, she's a clinic, uh, clinician scientist. Uh, she has a clinical appointment at Westmead Hospital as a clinical immunologist and immuno, uh, a clinical immunologist and immunopathologist, and has a particular interest in T cell function, and is building up uh, programs both in uh, mucosal immunity uh, and uh, particularly around these cells called tissue resonant memory cells and also a program in sepsis. Today she's going to present uh, data uh, that she generated both here and uh, in Oxford uh, during her postdoc and then relate that to very uh, important work that she's going to be doing around mucosal immunity and defense against human papillomavirus. Sarah over to you. Thanks, Tony. I'd also like to begin today by adding my acknowledgement to the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on today at the Kirby Institute, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. So today I'll be talking about local villains, tissue resident memory T cells in checkpoint inhibitor colitis. We'll begin with a brief introduction into immune checkpoint inhibition and the autoimmunity toxicities that result from these treatments, which have been denoted immune-related adverse events, or IRAE. I'll spend a particular amount of time on checkpoint inhibitor-related colitis, which is an area I've been involved in in the past three or four years, and then finish with some future directions of how um, we're tying over some of the study interests into the study for the prevention of anal cancer or the SPANK tissue resonance sub-study. So looking back in history, the very first immune checkpoints, CTLA-4 and PD-1, were actually discovered back in the 1980s as negative regulators of T cell function. And this would ultimately lead to the 2018 Nobel Prize being awarded to James Allison and to Suko Honji for this successful advancement of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 into therapeutic use in oncology. In 2013, Science Magazine named cancer immunotherapy as the breakthrough of the year. And while their efficacy was first shown in malignant melanoma, immune checkpoint inhibitors are now used for a wide variety of malignancy with a lot of further trials underway. There are 4,000 active immuno-oncology agents in the drug development pipeline, and those that um, target the PD-1 and, and PD-L1 axis is in excess of 2,000 alone. So how does it all work? Well, here um, the T cell is in blue, and T cells recognize their cognate antigen using their T cell receptor. The antigen is actually a peptide, part of a protein, which needs to be presented on a HMHC molecule on an antigen presenting cell. And if this happens, signal one is provided to the T cell. So that's the first part of an activation signal. But in order to activate, the T cell also requires a second signal, which is provided when CD28, uh, the co-stimulatory mo molecule, binds to its ligand B7 or B8. And if this happens, signal two is provided, and it's only then that the T cell will become activated into its effective functions. Now, terminally um, differentiated and activated and exhausted T cells um, have a tendency to upregulate CTLA-4, this immune checkpoint, and CTLA-4 actually competes with CD28 to bind B7. And of course, if this happens, that crucial signal two is not provided. And again, if T cells continuously um, are exposed to, to their antigen repeatedly, they can also upregulate PD-1. 
And if that binds its like and PDL1, again, there are negative signals provided to stop T cell activation. And so what happened with the development of checkpoint inhibitors is that um, these were synthesized antibodies to block the CTLA-4 protein, and that drug is known as ipilimumab, or to anti-PD-1, and those drugs are nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And the blocking of these checkpoint um, molecules results in an unbridled T cell activation. And so you activate essentially um, the majority of your T cell repertoire and within that repertoire, um, you unveil the specific anti-tumor response, which is why um, we've seen success in the immuno-oncology field. And so it was a real paradigm shift after several decades of having uh, no positive clinical trial results in the field of metastatic melanoma. Around 2015, we had the first reports of single agent anti-CTLA-4 or ipilimumabs being reported. So here on the left, we have a patient with metastatic melanoma um, who has on, undergone a PET scan. And here the black um, bulky disease is PET avid um, tumor taking up radioactive glucose. And you can see after several months of treatment with just ipilimumab, a lot of the tumor um, has regressed. So prior to checkpoint inhibition, the median survival for metastatic melanoma was around 10 months. There was some early um, breakthroughs with BRAF and MEK inhibitors, but when CTLA-4 monotherapy came along, that's in orange, you can see there was clear gains um, in overall, the percentage of overall survival on the y-axis over time. And then there were further gains when the anti-PD-1 um, treatments came on, that's in light red. But really when you combine the two treatments, which is the top line of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, um, you got synergistic effects. And currently, this is called dual checkpoint inhibition, um, is first line treatment for patients with metastatic melanoma if they are deemed fit enough to receive it. And so looking um, more deeply into these molecules, CTLA-4 um, actually controls the amplitude of immunological responses at quite an early time point in T cell activation. And so by blocking it, it's sort of um, quite a sledgehammer approach to checkpoint inhibition. CTLA-4 blocks, um, it reduces the IL-2 production um, involved in T cell proliferation. Interestingly, CTLA-4 is also constitutively expressed on regulatory T cells, which we know play important roles in dampening immune responses. And we don't fully understand um, the result of checkpoint inhibitors on the Treg population. And, um, and tellingly, when you knock out CTLA-4 expression in mice, these mice die prematurely of overwhelming lymphoproliferation and autoimmunity. So they don't survive into adulthood. So it just shows um, how severe that effect is. In slight contrast, um, the PD-1 axis acts at a later stage and limits T cell activities largely in the peripheral tissue. And correspondingly, PD-1 knockout mice have a far more subtle phenotype. And actually it's a non-lethal phenotype and these mice do um, grow into old age. And this animal model data actually corresponds very well with human um, results where anti-CTLA-4 has been consistently associated with a higher degree of autoimmune toxicity. Just a diagram to show how this works in vivo. So in this diagram, a non-small cell lung cancer is shown in pink as the tumor. And then a local T cell has the potential to recognize some tumor peptides on its T cell receptor. Um, but here PD-1, which is the red arrow, is being bound by its ligand on both the antigen presenting cell and on the tumor. And therefore the T cell is not activated. Uh, in the second panel, we now have uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors blocking the PD-1. And as a result, the local T cell can activate and migrate to the tumor and cause tumor cell lysis and death. This diagram is just to uh, reinforce that CTLA-4 and PD-1 are really just the tip of the icebergs in terms of what we know about immune checkpoints. And there's a slew of, of molecules that um, are known or are becoming known. And I'll particularly highlight LAG3 inhibitors, which are already moving into clinical trials, both in inflammatory bowel disease um, and in immuno-oncology.
There are three phases of response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. The first is uh, elimination, where you get the overdrive of the largely adaptive immune system responding to the tumor antigen. And then what happens is the, some tumor cells will survive checkpoint, initial checkpoint inhibition, um, but the host adaptive immune response will keep those rogue tumor cells in check. And I actually think of this as quite analogous to um, chronic HIV infection, where the host will achieve a viral set point um, due to the adaptive immune response. And, and then again, the, the, there can be a third phase of escape where unfortunately not all tumors will remain controlled by checkpoint um, inhibitions. The tumor may develop resistance to the anti-tumor response through loss of a specific antigen, change in cytokine expression in the tumor um, immune milieu, or upregulation of further checkpoint inhibitors. So a superior clinical response to checkpoint inhibitors is associated with an increased mutational burden of the tumor. And I'll speak a little bit more about that on the next slide. But basically, the more mutations you have in a tumor, there's an increased proportion of neoantigens or proteins that are not expressed by normal hosts. And neoantigens have the ability to be more immunogenic. So they recruit more T cells with a more diverse spectrum of T cell receptors that amplify the cytotoxic lymphocyte response. It's also um, Im um, important that the tumor has an increased capacity to respond to interferon gamma. And that's been shown by patients with deficiencies in JAK1 or interferon gamma signaling um, have been associated with a loss of response to anti-PD-1 therapy. And I've highlighted that in red because that will become um, important later on. Uh, increased expression of PDL1 in the tumor. So that's actually a known immunoevasion um, mechanism by many tumors. They upregulate PDL1 um, so that they can silence um, local T cells. But if that happens, it's actually um, favorable that that can be a targeted pathway using checkpoint inhibitor drugs. But if, you, if patients start with a very high tumor load overall, um, there's a poor response to checkpoint inhibit inhibitors. Um, and so this is what I was speaking before about mutational burden of cancers. So here you have a number of different human cancers on the x-axis and the somatic mutation rate on the y-axis. And so we, in immuno-oncology, we talk a lot about hot and cold tumors. And the hot tumors are over here on the right-hand axis. And these are tumors that just naturally have a lot of somatic mutations. So that means they throw up a lot of neoantigens. And histologically, uh, when you look at sections of the tumors, there's quite a lot of heavy lymphocytic infiltrate around the tumor. So they do generate this immune response. And we've known for a long time, it, it, far before checkpoint inhibitors were around, that that the um, adaptive immune system did seem to play a role in the control of melanoma, causing the occasional spontaneous regression in certain patients. Um, so up here we have melanoma, we've also got lung squamous cell carcinoma, bladder cancers and head and neck cancers. But as we travel further down towards the left-hand side, these are what are currently known as the cold tumors. Um, so we have things like medulloblastoma, acute myeloid leukemia, neuroblastoma. These are tumors which um, often, when you look at them histologically, do not attract a heavy lymphocytic association, um, possibly because they have less neoantigens or for other regulatory factors that are in the local environment. And what it seems to be is currently that it's more of the hot tumors that seem to be responding to trials in checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and so while these drugs are revolutionizing a lot of the treatments of many cancers, um, they're very much a double-edged sword and um, they come at the cost of immune-related adverse events. So these are iatrogenic autoimmune toxicities that most commonly affect the skin, gastrointestinal tract and endocrine organs, but as the panel on the left show really can affect nearly any body organ system. And these toxicities were evident in, evident in the licensing trials of the drugs. Um, so this is a big table, but I'll just show you the middle column is the combination checkpoint inhibition, and the left side is the PD-1 alone. So in combination therapy, around 40% will develop um, a, a rash, which is a skin toxicity, but only this drops to 26% in the PD-1 alone group. 
and colitis, which is also a major concern, is 37% in the dual treated patients, but only 4% in the PD-1 group. Um, so as I mentioned, these, these are toxicities caused by the checkpoint inhibitors and nearly any organ can be affected. The patterns of IRAE do depend on which checkpoint inhibitors you use, the underlying malignancy and individual susceptibility. Um, and clinically, most IRAEs are diagnoses of exclusion. We don't have particularly specific tests, um, but severe toxicities can require the discontinuation of checkpoint inhibitor therapy and treatment with corticosteroids plus other immunosuppressive agents. So the, there are several possible mechanisms, and this is something the field is still um, figuring out, but the, um, over, the current hypothesis is that as you um, cause that overactivation of the adaptive immune system, the um, IRAEs are off target collateral damage where the overactivated T cells react against healthy host tissues. Um, other theories include that there are common antigens between the tumor and the affected organ. In classical autoimmunity, women are more affected, but in IRAEs, men and women are equally affected and there's no clear relationship with age. There has been a lot of work looking at underlying genetic predispositions, including specific HLA types, um, but this work is still ongoing. Some IRAEs, um, seem to have more of a role um, for autoantibodies, particularly um, thyroiditis, hypo and hyperthyroidism, um, um, but this seems less relevant um, in other IRAEs. And there's um, ongoing interest in the role of the host microbiome and how this interacts with checkpoint inhibitors and tumor response and toxicity as well. What is interesting is how these toxicities present. And um, there is some consistency that in terms of when you start the agent, you're more likely to have these skin toxicities early, followed by gastrointestinal uh, toxicities, whereas lung and kidney toxicities can occur later. But as you can see, the error bars here are also quite wide. Um, so you need to keep um, an open mind basically. And with patients on these drugs, if there's clinical deterioration, you always need to uh, look at whether it could be a tumor progression, whether there's a concurrent infection, um, or indeed whether this could be an autoimmune toxicity from the checkpoint inhibitor. What about patients who have a pre-existing autoimmune disease? How do they fare on checkpoint inhibitors? Um, well, checkpoint inhibitors can be associated with exacerbations of previously diagnosed autoimmune disease or brand new IRAEs may develop. And it's important to note that patients with pre-existing autoimmunity were actually excluded from the initial licensing studies. Um, and so all this um, work has had to be done in um, since the drugs have been released and following up how patients have gone. Um, but in, in one um, excellent study led by um, Alex Menzies over at the Melanoma Institute here in Sydney, um, his group studied 119 patients with melanoma who either had a pre-existing autoimmune disease or a prior severe IRAE on CTLA-4 therapy. And then all, the whole cohort was treated with an anti-PD-1 drug. So there were 52 patients with a pre-existing autoimmune disease and only 20, so less than half of those had a flare of their pre-existing disease. And of the 20, only two actually had to discontinue their checkpoint inhibitor. Of the 67 patients who had a previous toxicity with CTLA-4 monotherapy, um, two developed a recurrence of the same toxicity, um, but then 23 developed a brand new IRAE H that required discontinuation with, and there were no treatment related deaths. So as you can see, it's not um, entirely straightforward um, how these toxicities develop. Um, currently, um, the current knowledge is that some patients with pre-existing autoimmune disease can be treated with checkpoint inhibitors with caution. Um, it's certainly better to involve multidisciplinary team management, including organ specific specialists with the medical oncologist and carefully weighing decisions to re-challenge following autoimmune disease or IRAE. Um, generally, if the toxicity is severe, 
and um, affects the brain, lung or heart, the checkpoint inhibitor will not be um, pursued. Um, but of course, it's, it's important to consider the whole picture in, in terms of goals of treatment, what alternatives there are and the expected clinical benefits. Uh, so I'll move now to the work that I was involved with, um, specifically looking at checkpoint inhibitor colitis. So this is the second most prevalent toxicity, but actually the one that causes um, the greatest um, mortality, so, so a big problem. And this was work done um, over in Oxford. So it was led by Dr. Vinnie Chung, who was a gastroenterology trainee. And we looked at all the patients at the John Ratcliffe who were treated with checkpoint inhibitors, as well as a cohort from Liverpool Hospital. So in total, there were 1,074 patients at the, across the two centres. And um, basically, most of the pa more patients um, received anti-PD-1 monotherapy compared to the combination therapy. But similar to the first trials, um, the rate of colitis, 32%, was much higher um, in combination therapy because of the presence of CTLA-4 compared to 9% with monotherapy. With the combination therapy here in red, the colitis presented earlier, so a median of 40 days compared to a median of 68 days. And you can also see this long tail, which um, occurred more with the anti-PD-1 monotherapy patients. So the majority of patients could be um, managed with steroid alone. So generally we start with oral steroids and then we can move to IV methylprednisone. But failing that, 22% uh, required um, salvage therapy with infliximab, which is the anti-TNF alpha blocker. And it's interesting, we're very interested in this um, because the use of infliximab has largely derived from the clinical guidelines for more classical inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. But from the outset, um, our group was very interested in whether checkpoint inhibitor colitis was indeed analogous to more classical forms of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and certainly the combination therapy patients with colitis were more likely to require infliximab um, and they needed their steroids um, longer for a median of 50 days compared to the PD-1 only patients. Um, what was interesting again was um, biomarkers that are useful in more classical IBD such as CRP, hemoglobin and albumin um, were not good biomarkers for checkpoint inhibitor colitis and did not seem to correlate or predict severity of disease. And our colleagues in anatomical pathology um, have quite a challenging time on reporting the biopsies um, because they're very heterogeneous. And this has been long been reported in the literature that when you look microscopically um, at the slides, there's, um, yeah, there's just a number of different histological features that can be found. Um, so when we started, we actually started a pilot study here in Sydney um, before I went to the UK um, using um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells that were banked by the Melanoma Institute um, and in patients who developed checkpoint inhibitor colitis versus those who are on treatment without colitis. Um, and I won't spend too much time here, but what we saw in the peripheral blood were actually huge on treatment effects. So there was huge amounts of activations of the T cells in the peripheral blood compartment. Um, but when we went to the UK and started working with colon biopsies, actually a lot of that um, noise could be, was overcome and, um, and we could see, we could tease apart the differences between the colitic and the non-colitic patients more easily. And so two things jumped out straight away. Um, so here we have, so this is colon bi lymphocytes isolated from colon biopsies from healthy um, volunteers, patients with an ulcerative colitis, colitis flare, and then, um, ipinevo patients with no adverse events versus ipinevo patients with colitis. So in ulcerative colitis, there's um, this known expansion of T regulatory cells. Um, this was actually how T regulatory cells were partially defined. And this actually didn't occur with the checkpoint inhibitor colitis. And we postulate that might be due to that high expression of CTLA-4 on the T regulatory cells. It might impede their ability um, to expand or function. And we also found there was a big expansion of activated memory CD8 T cells. So the proportion of CD8 T cells that were activated was very, very high in checkpoint inhibitor colitis, much higher than patients on the drug with no toxicity and other patients with ulcerative colitis or healthy volunteers. So these were some of the first clues that we found. 
And we started to ask the question whether maybe tissue resonant memory T cells um, could be involved seeing we, as we were dealing with tissues. Now, unlike classical CD8 T cells, which circulate through the blood and through the lymph nodes, um, tissue resident memory T cells are relatively more recently described and they're specialist cells that are adapted for long-term life within the tissues. And um, there are a lot of different subsets of tissue resident cells, but the best described are the CD8 positive um, cells that express CD103, which is alpha E integrin and constitutively CD69. Um, and Though it's very important to acknowledge that other subsets can um, take up tissue residency, including CD4 T cells and T regs. Um, so these cells that live in the tissues long term have a T cell receptor. Um, they're known to express high levels of PD1 and have a lot of cytotoxic um, granules inside of them. They have distinct transcriptional um, signatures compared to classical T cells, and they also downregulate a lot of um, integrin and adhesion molecules that normally promote egress from the tissue. And how do we know that they definitely exist? Um, well, a lot of work has been done, as I said, in animal models. And if you do these parabiosis experiments where you co join the circulatory system of mouse A and mouse B, the circulating T cells from the two mice will actually re equilibrate And so you'll have mouse B and mouse A um, T cells um, sort of shared between the two animals, but the tissue resident cells, which in this case was stuck on the skin, um, don't, don't re equilibrate and um, they stay put. Um, and then moving into humans, there's, there's really compelling data that's actually come out of the solid organ transplant field. Um, and, and in this one is from a paper about lung transplant. So if you take a, a set of lungs from the donor, um, when you transplant the lungs into the recipient, there'll be passenger tissue resident cells within the organ. And sampling over time shows that the green cells from the donor um, actually can persist in the tissue for many, many years. And that over time, the recipient will seed their own new populations of tissue resident memory cells into the lungs as well. So ultimately, you'll have two sets of tissue resident memory T cells um, based on origin. And how we can, how that's known is no um, organ transplants are perfectly matched for HLA. And so you can detect differences in the HLA by flow cytometry um, and therefore determine whether it's a, a donor or a recipient um, tissue resident memory cell. Um, so the study I worked on was called the PRIZE study, which um, aimed to predict immunotherapy adverse events. And basically we recruited patients who um, were referred to start checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and they were offered a baseline screening sigmoidoscopy before the treatment started. And then the cohort was followed, they were followed, and at five to seven weeks, all patients underwent a follow-up sigmoidoscopy. And we knew this was the time when the majority of colitis would present. So in that way, we could have both the checkpoint inhibitor colitis patients and the treated non-colitic controls. And then the patients who developed colitis, we could also follow longitudinally. Um, we're based at the Translational Gastroenterology Unit at the John Radcliffe Hospital, and they um, have a really active IBD program. So we were able to have other control groups such as patients with ulcerative colitis flare and also healthy controls um, who are people coming in for benign um, polyp surveillance. So all the work I'm about to present is based on tissue biopsies. So patients underwent four to six pinch biopsies when they had their sigmoidoscopy. And then the samples were used for flow cytometry, um, immunofluorescence microscopy, which I won't show today. RNA was extracted for RNA panels and bulk RNA-seq. And then we finished with some single cell um, protein and RNA-seq. Um, so this is just some of the initial flow cytometry. So we knew, as I showed you earlier, that um, the CD8 uh, positive subset looked suspicious. So now we could add in our tissue resident memory T cell markers. And we found that both um, in health and in checkpoint inhibitor colitis, the majority of those CD8 T cells are actually tissue resonant cells expressing the CD103, and they also express CD69. So about 80% in health, and then about 60 to 70% in checkpoint inhibitor um, patients were 
of the CD8 cells were tissue resident. And the only ones that dropped below 50% were the ulcerative colitis patients, suggesting that um, recruitment of circulating CD8 T cells plays more of a role in ulcerative colitis than in checkpoint inhibitor colitis. And then when we use, looked at the activation of these tissue resonant memory CD8s, we saw uh, you know, this large signal here with over 60% of the CD8 tissue resonant memory cells being activated in checkpoint inhibitor colitis um, compared with those on the same drugs without colitis. So we could be sure that this wasn't an on drug effect and um, it was much higher than seen in ulcerative colitis or indeed healthy volunteers. Um, so we used the co-expression of HLA-DR and CD38 um, as a marker of activation. So in these type of plots, the activated cells will sit up in quadrant two in the top right-hand corner. And you can see the red tissue resident memory cells um, were consistently more activated than the blue non-resident cells. And um, so we followed this marker and, and it seemed to fit um, with the clinical picture of what these, how these patients were presenting. So here, um, in the top panel is a patient who had a research endoscopy at week zero before checkpoint inhibitors were given. And if you just focus on the third column, these are the tissue resonant cells. So there's no activation here. Then at week nine, we can see this budding off and there is activation in other T cell compartments, but it's predominantly, um, it's more intense in the tissue resonant memory T cell population. And then the patient received some infliximab, um, to good effect and that activation um, resolves. And then the second patient actually had severe treatment refractory colitis. Um, and so you can see huge amounts of activated um, cells here and the disease was not responsive to corticosteroids. And then the second box here is on infliximab again, um, the disease is still going. And then finally, um, some vetalizumab, um, which again didn't work. And so we have this persistent activation. And and more about this later, but this patient actually went on to um, have a fecal microbiota transplant, which was successful um, at resolving this activation. So next we extracted from the same cohort of people um, their RNA. And we first looked at this using a nanostring um, autoimmunity panel, which was a 780 uh, gene panel. And on the left, the Venn diagram shows the number of genes upregulated compared to healthy colon. So you can see there was 173 upregulated genes in the checkpoint inhibitor colitis, and only 12 of those overlapped with um, the non-colitic treated patients. So we can be sure again that this is not an on-treatment effect. There was quite a lot of overlap with ulcerative colitis. Um, so there were some shared features, but also some unique features to checkpoint inhibitor colitis. And we ran the RNA um, transcriptome through the G-profiler um, um, analysis um, pathway. And while we got a lot of pathways involved in inflammation, the first sort of specific um, hit was this response to interferon gamma. So that was the first upregulated pathway that sort of mentioned a specific target. Um, so that was the next clue. And then we went on to use this similar RNA. I um, mean, instead, the nanostring was very good at looking at um, white blood cell markers, but we did a bulk RNA seq experiment, which actually was predominated by the gastric uh, mucosa signals. And the principal component analysis shows that the healthy gut is in blue, and then the checkpoint inhibitor colitis is in pink, and then the ulcerative colitis in yellow. And it just shows that the um, the transcriptome is different for these two diseases. So again, we're finding evidence that the two forms of inflammatory bowel disease are not um, entirely the same. And then with the bulk RNA seeker, bioinformatician Isan Nasiri um, ran his own uh, biological pathways analysis and the top hit for checkpoint inhibitor colitis was interferon gamma release. And we found this interesting because not only did it confirm our previous finding on the nanostring, but it also sat above the pathway for TNF alpha signaling, um, which as you'll recall is the target for infliximab, which is the current salvage therapy for these patients. So we were very interested then in seeing if we could try and tie the two things together, the activated tissue resident memory T cells and the interferon gamma response. And so we performed our first single cell RNA-seq um, experiment using the 10x 
platform, um, sorting on live CD45 cells. Um, so in this, ex these are some of the initial clusters. So the B cells are sitting here. We've got some monocytes in green and the T cell populations um, down below. So this red cluster four is actually the tissue resident memory T cell population. Um, it's there, it's definitely smaller than we saw in flow cytometry. And we believe that's because the cells were so highly activated, they were quite prone to um, cell death and apoptosis um, once removed from the body. And the 10X system actually has quite a long processing time. So we do believe that this proportion is underrepresented in these experiments compared to the flow cytometry, which was done more fresh. But what we could show for this cluster four was there's definitely more of those cells in the dual checkpoint colitis patients compared to in health, PD-1 colitis or ulcerative colitis. And then when we looked for checkpoint inhibitor expression, including CTLA-4 and PD-1, um, you can see actually that this cluster 4 has the highest level of expression of um, nearly all the checkpoint inhibitors measured. This first one here is the um, PDL one the ligand. Um, so it's really interesting because these are sort of frontline fighters in your organs and your tissues. They're cytotoxic CD8s. Um, prime to respond to their um, antigens, but obviously they're kept, kept under quite a lot of negative control because of this really high level of checkpoint inhibitor expression. And so, you know, our working hypothesis is that when you give the checkpoint inhibitors um, to target um, tumor specific T cells, you know, some of the the off-target effects is that you're actually degranulating and activating these tissue resident memory T cell populations um, in the gut. So we just wanted to be entirely sure. So we did a second single cell experiment on the BD Rhapsody system. This time we sorted on live T cells only. Um, so these are all T cells and the top half are the CD4 T cells and the bottom half are the CD8 and the yellow and purple cells are and this green population here all tissue, carry the tissue residency markers. Uh, you can see here the yellow ulcerative colitis um, patient samples are predominantly CD4, which, which fits with our data. And here the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor colitis is in green. And you can see that's predominantly this yellow tissue resident memory population. And then we looked for which cells were making interferon gamma. And um, you can see it nicely overlays predominantly with the CD8 tissue resident memory T cell populations with a small amount also being um, expressed by this CD4, CD103 positive. So it's probably a tissue resident CD4 population here as well. Um, so using this technology, we were finally able to marry our two signals that the interferon gamma signature was actually coming from those that population of CD8 positive tissue resident memory T cells. So at the same time as we had this data, we also had um, a very sick patient on the wards who'd been transferred to the John Radcliffe Hospital. Um, he had a non-small cell lung cancer and was treated with a platin-based chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab. And after two cycles, um, a, week, a week later, he developed checkpoint inhibitor colitis, which did not respond to initial steroids. Um, he progressed to receive two doses of infliximab and these are his endoscopy pictures. And you can see this um, raw um, white and red ulcerated um, colon. Um, because we treated the other patient with refractory disease with a successful fecal microbiota transplant, which is another experimental treatment, um, we liaised with the stool bank and there was more of the same stool. So then the next step was we actually did a fecal microbiota transplant using the same stool that had cured our first patient with this patient, but unfortunately um, it didn't work and he persisted to have um, extreme persisting checkpoint inhibitor colitis. And so finally, um, because we had the data about interferon gamma um, in consultation with the patient and the patient's medical oncologist and the caring gastroenterologist, um, we, there was agreement to trial tofacitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor, which is the signaling pathway for interferon gamma. Um, and he was treated with 10 milligrams BD for two weeks. And because in the large clinical trials of tofacitinib, there was a signal for thrombotic events, particularly deep vein thrombosis, we also co-administered um, clexane um, as prophylaxis against that. And actually his symptomology resolved within the first, well, it, didn't, it improved within about 
48 to 72 hours. And then his follow-up scopes um, a few weeks later showed the return of um, healthy um, gastric mucosa and he's remained in complete remission for his immunotherapy colitis and he was able to go back and have um, his conventional chemotherapy and he remains um, in a stable condition. So we had samples from the same time of the um, tissue resident memory T cells and you can see here the resolution of those activated cells um, following the tofacitinib and we also repeated the nanostring and showed a drop in JAK1 and JAK3 signaling and the corresponding um, STAT signaling as well. Um, so what did we learn? Well, the healthy colon normally has an intact um, epithelium, which keeps most of the bugs out. And there are populations both of CD4 and CD8 T cells. And the majority of CD8 T cells are actually these green tissue resident memory T cells. Um, I haven't spent that much time on ulcerative colitis today, but um, ulcerative colitis is largely um, associated with an expansion of CD4 positive T cells in the gastric mucosa and high levels of TNF alpha expression, um, which is probably why drugs like infliximab work very well. Um, we do note that some patients um, can be treated with tofacitinib in, in, in ulcerative colitis. So there's obviously some role for JAK inhibitors here as well. Uh, what we found in checkpoint inhibitor colitis um, was that the pathology was predominated by activated CD8 positive tissue resident memory T cells that were making a lot of interferon gamma. And we were able to successfully target that in one patient um, even after they'd failed, um, they'd not responded to anti-TNF treatment or fecal microbiota transplant. Um, so, so there's this emerging um, potential role for JAK inhibitor tofacitinib to be used as a salvage therapy in severe treatment refractory colitis. And around the time we were writing up, there were um, a couple of further reports just of empirical use of tofacitinib showing that it could be used um, without any of the translational um, side of things. Um, but obviously further efficacy needs to be proven in a randomized control trial. Um, I also wanted to mention that in our reported patient, uh, he did have metastatic disease and he had not failed, he had not responded to the checkpoint inhibitor from a tumor point of, of view, which was one of the reasons why he was offered the tofacitinib. But the situation could have been very different, for example, in a patient who was in complete remission from their tumor, um, because the use of tofacitinib by disabling the interferon gamma pathway um, may raise the risk of tumor outgrowth, as I mentioned earlier, because interferon gamma appears very important for overall tumor control. Um, but we acknowledge the lack of um, prospective randomized control trials in this area. Uh, so we treated um, the patient in early 2020, and then by September 2021, the FDA in America actually put a box warning on JAK inhibitors, including tofacitinib, because in large um, epidemiological studies, um, there was um, a rise in the incidence of heart-related events, cancer, blood clots, drug for two weeks, but many patients um, remain on these drugs for a long time. Um, so again, another complication in, in the use of such therapy. Um, but in saying that there are other um, potential targets for tissue resident memory T cells, and we've recently heard of a company making a monoclonal to CD103, which is a canonical marker of tissue resident CD8s. So there may even be other ways of um, targeting these, these pathogenic cells. Uh, I just wanted to finish by acknowledging um, the team for the checkpoint inhibitor colitis. So Oliver Brain was the gastroenterologist who was the PI and um, Paul Klenemann was my co-supervisor and whose lab that I worked in. Um, ben Fairfax and Isan Nasiri did the bioinformatics and I was funded as part of the Oxford BMS fellowship program with additional funding from NanoStream. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for a really terrific talk. Um, so uh, we can, the audience can ask questions by uh, entering the questions in the Q&A box. Um, and Sarah, there's already a question from, from Chan. Uh, and Chan asks, uh, Rhapsody data demonstrated that uh, TRM CD4 cells are also, also contribute to interferon gamma production in ulcerative colitis. What subset do these CD4s belong to? Are they Th1 or cytotoxic? And do these cells exist in healthy tissue? 
Um, so yeah, I think you're talking about in the checkpoint inhibitor colitis, there was that population of CD4 cells that express CD103. So we think that um, they're a tissue resident CD4 population. Um, and I think because of the interferon gamma, they would be TH1. Um, and yeah, I, we didn't see much interferon gamma being produced by the healthy colon. So I think it was definitely part of the, um, of the pathology. So if I could just extend that question a bit. So would you, so in your uh, patient with, or when your patients with colitis, they overproduce interferon gamma, mm. would you predict that from their transcription, uh, from their, from their natural state that when you take away those block those blocks on their function that they would produce interferon gamma as one of their cytokines i noted that t bed is one of the transcription factors that uh define their lineage um, yeah it was interesting i actually did a whole lot of um ex vivo work that um <laughs> didn't make it in and because they look like um, so basically isolating the tissue resident T cells and trying to block it um, in the lab. Um, but I couldn't get, we, could, we couldn't get it to work. So they actually, we couldn't ex vivo get the cells to activate as readily as we thought we would be able to. So we put like anti-CTLA4 and anti-PD1 on ex vivo TRMs in, in tissue culture, but it was very hard to get, get the same level of activation. And our conclusions from that work was it must be quite complex the crosstalk between the like the microenvironment of the colon and also all probably the innate cells. I think there's a whole inflammatory um, like um, snowball effect that happens, and probably the TRMs are near the beginning. But I do think that there's probably innate cells involved there, and probably the tissue signals are important at propagating propagating it. Okay. So Fabio, um, Fabio uh, has, uh, has said, great talk, Sarah. Do you know if anyone has looked at the T TCR expression in these subsets? Ben Fa Fairfax showed a significant correlation of T cell clonal expansion and ICB outcome in breast cancer. Um, yeah, so Ben was working, he did all that from peripheral blood and we actually do, we did do the TCR work on this but we Ben felt that um, there was just not enough T cells to be sure so basically what we found it was very hard to show if there was a skewing um, because in the checkpoint inhibitor colitis you might have an overrepresentation of some TCRs but then when you looked in the healthy population the same or similar TCRs could also be overrepresented represented um, and so even in a healthy person, there's skewing. And so we didn't feel that we were powered enough to make a meaningful comment. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think overall, um, yeah, I think the patient groups were quite similar. Even the, treat, the checkpoint inhibitor patients were quite similar, whether they developed the colitis or not the colitis. So we didn't get, there wasn't like a one dominant TCR that stood out. And I think the data was just too complex to be sure, which is why we didn't include it. Okay. Um, Chan's also asked, is there an absence of uh, tissue resident uh, memory T regs that would normally suppress these activated CD8 tissue resident memory cells? Yeah, so given, um, I guess, both of our backgrounds, um, Chan, heading into this project, my leading hypothesis was that these diseases were due to a dysfunction of Tregs, and I knew that Tregs expressed high level CTLA-4. So I went in thinking that Tregs were going to be quite central to it. Um, all I can say is you can still definitely see Tregs in the tissue, but they don't seem to expand in response to the inflammation like you see in ulcerative colitis. So in ulcerative colitis, you can definitely see this expanded Treg population. I think the checkpoint inhibitor somehow disables that. They're still there, you can still see them, but I just, I do wonder about their functionality and whether that could be playing some kind of additional role. Um, but because there was such a minor population, um, yeah, we didn't really pursue that, but I still think they could be, like their dysfunction could be contributing um, 
to the unbridled inflammation that we're seeing. So Sarah, given your hypothesis that the TRMs are at the basis of this, um, you'd, you'd expect that uh, mechanisms that inhibit uh, the um, translocation of cells, such as the monoclonal vetaluzumab, which is an alpha-4 beta-7 inhibitor, would not work in this condition. Are, are there case reports or has anyone looked at vetaluzumab in, in this situation to see whether that sort of supports your hypothesis? Yeah, so um, at the TGU, vetalizumab was on the list of um, agents that were used in these patients. So, um, so the group had treated patients with vetalizumab and there were definitely cases where it seemed to make a difference. Um, but, um, but yeah, it didn't seem to fit with what we were seeing. Um, yeah, it's hard. It, I mean, the TRMs do sort of spin off from circulating cells. So, so there could be some pathway where, um, you know, could be stopping progenitor TRMs from seeding into the colon. But certainly um, from our data, we know that the colon is laden with TRMs to begin with, and they're all sitting there. But it might play a role in, I guess, relapse of disease or how long it goes on for. But yeah, Oliver Brain, who um, was the PR, he's definitely said he had cases where he thought vitalizumab had worked, um, but that then others where it had failed as well. And, and the FMT is another wild card because we definitely had one responder where by replacing the microbiome, right. um, it worked, but then using the same stool in a different patient, it didn't. So yeah, there's obviously still unanswered questions. Whereas vitalizumab does work quite often, not all the time, but frequently, and is one of the mainstays of treatment of things like ulcerative colitis, which yeah. from your data would seem to be due to the influx of circulating CD4 T cells. Yeah, yeah. So I think the million dollar question, the natural extension of this work is, well, if it is the TRMs, it still doesn't explain why some people get the colitis and some people don't. And so some ideas we've been discussing is, um, you know, is it something to do with having a recent, um, you know, gastrointestinal infection? Is does CMV play a role? Um, some kind of, um, you know, uh, is a is there some predisposing factor about why some people then develop the check one hippocleitis and other people don't? Um, to really predict that, and and that's something we don't understand. Which is where your points about the microenvironment of the colon mm. might be really important. Yeah. yeah. And it perhaps, the, I mean, I'm not a great believer in, in the microbiota transplant, but perhaps it's resetting that, the microenvironment as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Sarah. Um, we're coming up for the hour. So um, thanks for a great presentation. And we look forward to the work on the, uh, a bit further down the colon um, with the HPV disease. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening.